Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here to be with you at Wheaton. I have many good friends here, and it's always a pleasure to come. And this morning especially, it's already been a delight to worship with you. Um, feel free to relax at this point in chapel and get real comfortable in your chairs because we're talking about the vice of rest today, the vice of sloth. Don't fall asleep, though, because then you flunk the quiz at the end. All right. I am going to be talking in this next few days about the false promises of sin, and the first one that I'll be talking about today is the vice of sloth. Um, my research has uh, been on the seven deadly sins, um, and you might think that this is completely predictable coming from a good Calvinist who's all hung up on total depravity. But what I would like to say before I begin the series, thank you, thank you. Before I begin the series, what I'd like to say is that I really don't want the focus to be on sin, guilt, and feeling like dirt about ourselves. The point in the point of the spiritual program and the historical people who represent that program, the point is to diagnose the things that are troubling us and that um, are self-destructive tendencies in order to find healing and find liberation. And my own work on the seven deadly sins began with that kind of story. I found a diagnosis for something that I had been struggling with in my life, and finding a name for it was a path forward to becoming free from it. And so that's my hope for you in this series, that you will hear um, stories about the things that trouble us and that pull us away from a uh, relationship with God and that you will find a way forward to healing and wholeness from there. All right, so the first sin that we'll be talking about or the first vice we'll be talking about is the vice of sloth, and it's a confusing one. Um, and I would like to begin, therefore, by talking a little bit about what true rest might amount to. Um, in Matthew 11, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. The catechism I grew up with puts it this way. What is your only comfort in life and in death? The answer, my only comfort in life and in death is that I belong, body and soul, in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So a picture of true rest presented in Scripture and teachings about Scripture, how do we mess this up? How do we turn from true rest to false rest? Um, this is going to be especially difficult to understand. I started with a hard one. Um, because our culture uses the term sloth to designate something that looks a lot more like laziness. Make sure I get my clicker working here. Here we go. So when we think about sloth, the way that it's talked about um, in common conversation today, we're going to hear a lot more about laziness than we hear about vice or sin. So um, here's some sloth motivational tapes telling you to relax and take your time. Um, life goes on whether you're asleep or not. Uh, there's also another um, speaker uh, who describes sloth as a uh, not only not a deadly sin, but one of the world's most amiable weaknesses. In fact, he says we would be preserved for most of the worst crimes out there if people would just be a little bit more lazy and stay at home. You do know that the crime rate drops in the winter because it takes so much trouble to go outside and get all your boots and your coat on and all the rest of it. All right, and then last, um, that there's a spoof of all the seven deadly sins in Harper's Magazine, and this is the one on sloth, the idea that um, if we just been a little bit more lazy in the Garden of Eden, we wouldn't have committed any of the more ambitious sins, like, you know, pride and actually going out to get an apple or two. So at any rate, um, if you need a tutorial, if you haven't mastered this yourself, you can always read Wendy Wasserstein's lovely parody of self-help literature. She wrote a book on how to become slothful, um, which is a, a parody uh, making fun of all the different how-to lists that you get in magazines and books these days on, uh, in the self-help movement. So um, you can find all sorts of... Um, ways to become slothful here. I prefer the 12-hour epic on Thomas Aquinas, personally, because that's my research. Uh, but you can find one. Um, maybe the breakfast bars with Ambien are more your cup of tea. All right, so you can see that the way we talk about sloth nowadays has to do more with laziness and silliness than it does with sin. So let's think about um, 
how to correct or add another layer to that way of talking about sloth. The Desert Fathers were a group of Christians who um, lived in the desert south of Alexandria in the fourth century AD. And sloth was really their signature invention. They were the first people who named this thing, described it in detail. Um, and they were trying to live intentionally in communion with God. So they left their um, jobs and family communities in the city and went out into the desert to try to be focused and intentional um, in their walk with God, seeking communion with him, seeking to kind of uh, face temptation. And their model was Christ in the desert in his wilderness temptations. So they were deliberately trying to model their lives after Jesus Christ in doing so. And here's uh, John Cassian, one of the Desert Fathers, and his description of what they were about in the desert. He said, we're here to look at our struggles as if in a mirror. And having been taught the causes and remedies for the vices by which we're troubled, we'll learn about future contests, strategies, before they come in, and we'll be instructed about how to watch out for temptation, how to meet it, how to strategize to fight against it. So the other metaphor he uses is the diagnosis of a disease turning to Christ, the physician of souls for healing. So the, the movement here is to be very intentional about um, the difficulties and the temptations that press on us, especially when we're stripped of distractions out there in the desert. Um, and then to also strategize and train ourselves to be athletes of Christ in facing those. So Evagrius was one of the first people to come up with the list of uh, capital vices, or as they're now known, seven deadly sins. And you'll notice there aren't seven of them. How many are there? Count up on the list there. There's nine or eight, depending on who's making the list. So it's, it's really not meant to be sort of a canonical seven. It's more meant to be more of a Here's a list of the top 10 things that Christians struggle with when they try to live intentionally for Christ, okay? So we're not trying to name the worst things out there. We're trying to name perennial sins and the kind of things that get rooted in us and then just bear lots of fruit, the poisonous kind, okay? And Evagrius says Acadia or sloth is a serious one. It's not laziness, it's not silliness, it's a big deal. As he says, um, it can envelop the whole soul and strangle the mind. And it has, it doesn't have the same kind of ebb and flow that other temptations do. Once it gets a hold of you, it hangs on. All right, so he took it very seriously. Here's another description that he gave of Acadia or sloth. He called it the noonday demon. He says, it, uh, the noonday demon, it makes it appear that the sun moves slowly or not at all, and the day seems to be 50 hours long. Then he compels the monk to look constantly toward the windows to try to jump out of his cell, to watch the sun to see how far it is from the ninth hour, that's when they got lunch, and to look this way and that way. And he instills in the monk a dislike for the place, the cell, the desert place and community that he has chosen and committed his life to. He instills a dislike for the state of life he has chosen itself, all right, and for all the things that go with it. And in short, um, he employs every device to make the monk leave his cell and flee the stadium. What's going on here? This might just sound like a description of you in the library during exam period, right? After the fourth hour of studying for your organic chemistry exam, you're ready to bail. It's much more serious than this. Evagria says, look, you've committed yourself to this desert sojourn to be like Christ. That's your vocation. It's your calling. You're committed to it. And now, what does the monk want to do? Get out. He's bored. He's listless. He's restless when he has to stay. And he wants nothing more than to escape. All right. Now, what Aquinas does is says, guess what? That's not a problem just for monks in the desert many millennia ago. That's a problem for all Christians. Think about um, our vocation as Christians. He's, Aquinas says it's really about our relationship with God. We're all meant to be called into communion with God. We all have to live intentionally that way, and it's going to involve, as we'll find out, a struggle for all of us. So Aquinas says, with respect to our spiritual life, there's communion, a relationship of 
intimacy between us and God. That's going to be imperfect in this life, but it will be perfected in heaven when we see God face to face. So note, we've got a lifetime to grow in relationship of communion with God. So he's gonna talk about this love that we have for God as a kind of friendship, as an ongoing relationship. Now sloth, then, is going to be a dislike for or a chafing against or a discomfort with our relationship with God, that relationship of communion. That's what sloth's target is, right? So to be loved by God, and to love him back is to sign up for a process of transformation. You might know it better as sanctification, right? It's called to be uh, responsive with love of our own and to be changed. The Apostle Paul puts it this way. Love's calling on you is to put off the old self and the old sinful nature with its practices and to take on Christ and all the Christ-like virtues um, to become a new creation. That's a process the slothful person is resisting in their sloth. It's laziness not about work. It's not laziness about um, diligent effort. It's not um, seeking physical comfort. It's resistance to the transforming call that we have to grow in communion with God. So the slothful person wants loving God to be easy. Right? It may feel super inspirational, if you're in chapel and the music is great and everything is wonderful in your life, all right, then we're like all about our relationship with God and it's easy and comfortable and wonderful and fun. What about when it gets tough? What about when it gets boring? What about when we go through dry times? What about when doubts plague us? What about when God asks things of us um, that we would rather not die to? We have an old sinful self after all, which is a self to which we are awfully attached. It's awfully hard to lay that down sometimes. Anne Lamott put it this way, the secret to know about the Christian life is that God loves and accepts you right now just the way you are. But he also loves you too much to let you stay like that. So he's gonna call you to grow. And the question is, are you in? Or are you resistant? Are you hanging back? The slothful person is going to resist the demands of that relationship with God. The slothful one says, I want to be in relationship with God, but I'm not so willing to go through all that hard transformation stuff. I want the comfort and security of being loved by God, but I, I don't want all the like, super deep investment stuff that it's asking of me. Here's my analogy. Being married, okay? Or if you're not married yet, being part of a church family or even your family of origin. Any long-term relationship tends to be like this, okay? Think of this married couple. When they walk down the center aisle and say their vows and say, I do, they're married. It's a done deal. It's a fact. But to be married is something they will have to keep doing in order to keep living out their vows, keep staying in relationship, maintaining that relationship for as long as their lives shall last. And let me tell you, as someone who's been married a few years, sometimes the long course of a lifetime feels really long, okay? It's not always as fun as it was on your wedding day, sad to say, and sometimes it is. But the point is to love another person is gonna put demands on you. It's gonna be a certain level of responsibility, um, and that's what sloth is going to try to undermine that long course of a lifetime. It's not always walking down the aisle young and beautiful. Sometimes it's fighting and learning to forgive. Sometimes it's being up all night with a baby. Sometimes it's um, finding a difference of opinion that we, uh, makes us lay in bed with our backs to each other at night. And it has to last until we're old. Right? We have to keep investing in a relationship and um, growing deeper in our love for each other. And that requires effort, though not necessarily physical effort. Think about a, um, a couple who's had a fight, for example. Um, it's not the effort of getting up and walking across the room to say, I'm sorry. It's not the physical effort. It's the spiritual effort that it takes to forgive and repair and grow in that relationship. Now, let's 
break this back down. How does sloth show up as false rest? Well, interestingly enough, it can be confused with laziness in the cases when we're present but not really there. Okay, so cases in which you're bored or you're checked out or you're apathetic or you're resigned, it's sloth can often look like a kind of false rest. It can look lazy. But there's also this restless side of sloth. If you can escape those demands, if you can hide from those demands through busy activity, maybe it's ministry activity, maybe it's worthwhile, diligent studying, maybe it's entertainment, maybe it's being on your phone all day, whatever you can do to cover up that call to grow with activity, that can be a kind of restless side of sloth. So here's the danger. You might be a super diligent, active, busy person who goes and does chapel talks all over the country and still be slothful, right? See me pointing the finger at myself? When I wrote the chapter in my book on sloth, I thought, oh, good, this is advice I surely don't have because I'm, you know, busy, 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 type A and all the rest of it. Oh, no, there's a form of sloth for us too, trust me. All right, so symptom, symptomatically, sloth can be a kind of disinvestment in your relationship with God, and that can come out in terms of apathy, or it can come out in forms of escapism, where sloth actually looks like busyness. Now, I wouldn't leave you without telling you what to do about sloth, okay? We've got the diagnosis. Now, how do we move toward healing? Evagrius um, has a couple of quotes about the stability needed to counteract sloth. And here's what he says. The spirit of Acadia, his word for sloth, drives the monk out of his cell, but the monk who possesses perseverance will ever cultivate tranquility. In the same way, a light breeze bends a feeble plant. A fantasy about fleeing drags off the person overcome by Acadia. And lastly, the force of the wind does not shake a well-rooted tree. Acadia does not bend the soul that is firmly established. So the idea is these relationships, and in particular our relationship with God, is meant to be a crucible of self-transformation. And if you're constantly running away and distracting yourself with other stuff, you don't get that work done. You're not willing to face it. So if you're relationship hopping or you're church shopping, you're not trying to change. You're trying to change your circumstances, change your environment, change your stimulation without changing your own heart, okay, without having that willingness. So stability, standing your ground, staying put is the way to get somewhere. David Rocky says, listlessness or Acadia tempts the monk to give up the fight against the demons. And the primary way to resist it, therefore, is to remain in your cell and hold your ground. So the temptation in Acadia is to check out or to flee. And the answer then, the remedy is to stay, to stick. All right, now think about this in a human relationship. All right, your temptation when things get uh, when there's conflict or there's confrontation or there's difficulty or there's boredom, is to go find something else, better, right? What happens if you stay? What happens if you stay? That's the question to ask yourself. So the, the film that I used to illustrate this is now a big 80s throwback. You'll have to go watch it on Netflix after chapel. That's your homework assignment from chapel today. Um, in this movie, Phil Connors is a weatherman who gets stuck inexplicably um, living Groundhog Day, February 2, over and over and over and over and over again, something like a thousand times, in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania. And this, this, this film is, in a sense, a story of sloth and its remedy. So I think it gives you both a picture of the forms that sloth can take and also then a picture of how it can be overcome. It's gonna do so with this relationship, human relationship analogy again. So when Phil shows up in Punxsutawney, he despises the townspeople, they're a bunch of idiot rednecks, um, and he wants nothing more than to get out of town. Well, now he's stuck there. And so first, without changing himself, he seeks to manipulate his environment and goes to all kinds of lengths of busyness and planning to m manipulate people and manipulate the place to give him what he wants without changing. And what happens is that he finds out he can't get what he really longs for. 
with that strategy, okay? What he longs for, most of all, is to have a relationship with his coworker, Rita, and mostly just to get her in bed, okay? He's not really interested in, like, love and all that. Just wants the pleasure. And he can't win Rita over, no matter how hard he tries, no matter how busy he is. So then Phil is stuck in Groundhog Day, and he despairs. He can't get Rita the way he is, and he's also unwilling to change himself. So there he sits, and he's, there's a scene where he's in despair. He's drinking um, Jim Beam and watching Jeopardy for the millionth time um, and eating popcorn in his pajamas, and um, he, even his suicide escape attempts haven't helped him get out of Punxsutawney. Finally, in the film, he tries to change. He learns to meet the needs of the townspeople. He learns to love them, and in the end, wins Rita's love that way, unbeknownst to him that that's the end of the process. The whole point of the story, however, is that first Phil's really busy trying not to be in Punxsutawney and not to change in the ways that, that he's called to change um, in order to be able to love other people. Then he's sort of stuck in apathetic despair Okay, so you get the restlessness and the false rest. And then it's by being stuck in Punxsutawney and trying to learn to live there and trying to learn the to love the people that he's with, that's the kind of forced discipline of stabilitas that Phil has to go through in order to learn to really love. And at the end of the film then, he finds the kind of fulfillment his heart's really seeking for. And I like to think of this film as old and cheesy as it is, as a kind of parable of sloth. All right, so now you can go home and watch it and see if you agree with me. The point is, these committed relationships are going to change us. They're going to make demands on us. They're going to transform us. And the question for the slothful person is, are you willing? Are you willing to go the distance? Are you willing to stay put and stay through the long course of a lifetime and be transformed? Now, my challenge for you today is, what does stability or stabilitas, this discipline, look like for you? Because we want to have positive practices that protect us from sloth and wean us off our slothful ways. What does it look like today to be in stable relationships in communities? One of the things that... Um, Calvin College has tried to do is develop something called Project Neighborhood Houses. So instead of um, moving off campus your junior and senior year and living in a cheap rental and sort of living there for a year and then moving back out, zero investment in the community, in the, in the neighborhood, um, in the people living on the block, we've, we've bought houses, the college owns houses around campus and various students commit to living intentionally together in these houses and to be in relationship with each other, and to be in that neighborhood and learn to be a good neighbor in that place. So there's a creative, I think, new approach to stability and stabilitas in a time of life like you're in right now, which is very transient, lots of things changing. What does it look to be planted somewhere? and to grow in ways that that place and those people demand of you. God works through those particular places to grow us and change us. So loving God is a relationship that will change us, and it's not easy, it's not comfortable always, to die to that old self and to grow in the ways that God calls us to be made new, like our Savior Jesus Christ. It is, however, the only way to resist sloth, and it is a task that will take most of us a lifetime. May God find us faithful in it, and may we ultimately find our rest in him.